Hi, I'm Jason Hobdy. Welcome to the Introduction to Time Value of Money and Calculator class here at the College for Financial Planning. If you're like many of our students, when you first realize you're going to have to put down the software and pick up a calculator, this will be your salvation. Don't panic, you can do this. The calculator that we'll be using and supporting throughout our classes is the HP 10B2 or 10B2 Plus. The only difference between the two is the 10B2 Plus has some expanded bond functions that we will not need for our classes here, so either model is fine. You can pick one up at your local office store for probably around $30, so they're really rather inexpensive. And personally, I find them to be the most intuitively easy to learn if you're not or comfortable rather with financial calculators. This class will be broken into three different sections. We'll begin with what we refer to as basic time value of money calculations. That's going to be things like calculating future value, present value, or value of an income stream. After that, we'll move on to the intermediate level class where we'll perform calculations such as bond valuation, yield to maturity, yield to call, calculations of that nature. Then we'll conclude with the advanced version or the advanced class that's going to cover things like valuing uneven series of cash flows. So when we refer to present value versus future value, present value involves discounting. So we know a future sum that we want to get to and we're trying to discount back to see how much we have to start with in order to accumulate the amount we want in the set period of time. Future value is just the opposite. We start with a known sum, how many years we have to work with, what interest rate we think we can earn, and we're calculating how much that's going to be worth that many years down the road. Finally, we'll wrap up with annuity payments. Annuity payments are broken into two different classifications. There's ordinary annuities, which simply means the payment is received at the end of the period, and there's annuities due, which means the payment is received at the beginning of the period. It's very important to keep this distinction when working with annuity streams or income streams to get the correct calculation and result. Now, before we get into calculations, let's take a look at the calculator and look, go over some of the most frequently used keys and the order of sequence. Here you see an HP 10B2 calculator. Now, many of you probably have the 10B2 Plus rather than the 10B2, and again, as I mentioned earlier, the only difference between the two is the 10B2 Plus has extended bond calculation uh, functions that we don't need for this class. So for purposes of this class and the illustrations, we'll be using this 10B2 emulator. Now, if you look at the top of the calculator, you'll see five keys starting with the letter N and ending with FV. For your basic and intermediate calculations or basic or intermediate level calculations, these are going to be the keys you use almost exclusively. As you will also note, below the white lettering are different functions in orange. These are the secondary functions and some of these we will be using. For example, if you look at the PMT key, that stands for payment, you see a P slash YR. This is where we set the number of compounding periods per year before we go into a calculation. This is really critical, and if you don't remember to set this correctly, you will get the wrong answer. So, how do we set the number of compounding periods per year? If you look in the lower left-hand side, you will see an orange downshift button. This gets us access to that secondary function. Now, below that, you'll see a clear button, the letter C. Its secondary function is clear all. So, if we hit the downshift key and then the clear all function, you will see in this example a flash of 12 P-YR. What this tells us is that we have our calculator set for 12 compounding periods per year or monthly compounding. Now, I would suggest everyone go through this function before you calculate any problem every time. Usually you're going to find annual or in the case of working with bonds, semi-annual compounding. So rather than having to remember to multiply the number of years by the number of compounding periods, I'm going to show you how to get the calculator to do that work for you. So first, we're going to change from our 12 compounding periods to 1. So what we do is we hit the number 1, then we hit our downshift key, and then we go to the second function, the P slash YR under the payment key. This should set us for annual compounding, and we can double check that by hitting downshift and then clear all. So as you can see, we have one compounding period per year. Now, 
going back up to our top row of keys, the letter N stands for the number of compounding periods. And as you can see below, the secondary function is an asterisk and then the P slash YR. This secondary function is where you can get the calculator to do the work for you. So let's say we have a bond problem where we're using semi-annual compounding. Our first step is going to be to change to two compounding periods per year. So we're going to hit the number two, then the downshift key, then our payments per or pardon me, compounding periods per year. We'll double check that by hitting shift, clear all. And if I slip and say shift instead of downshift, no, I mean the orange downshift key every time. And we will see that we've now got two compounding periods per year. So if we had a bond that matures in 10 years and it's semi-annual compounding, the way we would set the number of compounding periods is to enter the number of 10 for the year, or number of years, the downshift key, and then our compounding key. And you'll see the number 20 flash. What happens here is the calculator is taking 10 years that we've entered and multiplying it by the number of compounding periods that we have programmed in. I suggest very strongly that you get in the habit of going through this so that you don't forget sometimes if you have a 10-year bond and forget that there's semi-annual compounding and you wind up entering 10 compounding periods rather than 20. So even when you have annual compounding, I would always go through the number of years, downshift, and then times the compounding periods per year just to stay consistent and in the habit. Now, the other trick with these calculators is when we're doing time value of money calculations, we're going to be entering the number of compounding periods. We already went over the N key. Next is the I slash YR key. This is what we're going to use to enter the current interest rate. The next key, PV, stands for present value. That's the value of something today or the starting point. The next key is going to be the PMT or payment key. So if we have cash flows like interest being received from a bond, that's the key we're going to use to enter that. And then finally, FV, which is future value. So when we're doing time value money calculations, if there are no cash flows involved, we're going to be given three of these variables and solve for the fourth. When there's cash flows involved, we're going to be giving four or given four variables and solving for the fifth. With these financial calculators, as we enter that information, it's going to hang on to it in the register. So going back to the clear button, if I've entered all my variables and gotten my result and I hit just the clear button, it's only going to clear out the last entry that I made. If, however, I say downshift and then clear all, that will clear out the entire registry. Where this gets useful is if someone says, how much do I need today if I can earn, say, 7% a year in order to accumulate a million dollars in 20 years? So you go through, you enter all the figures, and then they say, well, what if I think I can earn 9%? As long as you haven't clear all on the register, you can go back and simply change the interest rate per year, hit your present value key again, and it will remember the rest of that information. The one other key that's important to remember that has to do with income streams is the begin and end mode. This can be found in the second row under the MAR key and this has to do with whether we're dealing with an ordinary annuity or an annuity due. As we mentioned in the introduction, an ordinary annuity is one where the payment is being received at the end of a period and therefore you want your calculator set to the end mode. An annuity due is an income stream where the payment is being received at the beginning rather than the end of the period and you want to set your calculator to begin mode. Now with the 10B2 or 10B2 plus when you are in end mode you will see nothing on the screen. If you shift to begin mode you hit your downshift key then the MAR key for that second function and now you'll notice on the screen it's going to say begin or for some of you it may say just BEG. Right, this is another important function to check before you perform any calculation is always make sure you're on the correct mode. My suggestion and advice is to always default to the end mode unless you are told specifically in a problem that the payment is occurring at the beginning of each period.